2G, page 171. Isabel, somewhere on the Caribbean Sea, 1994, three days from home. Isabel woke to a warm orange glow on the horizon and a silver sea stretching up before them like a mirror. It was as though the storm had been some kind of feverish nightmare. Senior Castillo woke from his nightmare too, parched like a man who'd been lost in the desert. He drank almost half of one of the few gallons of water they had left in one long chug, then laid back against the side of the boat. Isabel worried about her father, about her mother. For mommy, the nightmare was just beginning. The illness she'd felt as the storm began had gotten worse in the night, and now she'd had a fever hotter than the rising sun. Lido dipped a scratch of shirt into the cool seawater and draped across his daughter's forehead to cool her. But without the aspirin from the lost medicine box, there was no way to bring the fever down. The baby, Mommy moaned, holding her stomach. The baby will be fine, Lido told her. A good, strong, healthy baby boy. Lido and Signora Castillo took care of Isabel's mother. Poppy and Luis got the engine restarted and bathed it with water to keep it cool. Amara at the rudder steered them north now that the sun was in the sky. Everybody had a job, it seemed, except Isabel and Ivan. Isabel bumped shoulders and stepped on toes as she wobbled her way over to Ivan in the prow of the boat. She sat down beside him with a huff. I feel useless, she told Ivan. I know, he said, me too. They sat for a while in silence before Ivan said, Do you think we'll have to do algebra in our new American school? Isabel laughed. Yes. Will they have political rallies every day at school in the U.S.? Will we have to work in the fields all afternoon? His eyes went wide. Do you think we'll have to carry guns to protect us from all the shootings? I don't know, Isabel told him. Their teachers told them all the time how homeless people starved in the streets of the U.S. and how people who couldn't afford to pay for doctors got sick and died and how thousands of people were killed by guns every year. As happy as she had been to go to El Norte, Isabel suddenly worried that it wouldn't be as magical a place as everyone in the boat believed. <clears throat> no matter what, I'm glad you came with us, Ivan said. Now we can live next door to each other forever. Isabel blushed and looked at her feet. She liked that thought. Castro's face was even more submerged now, which meant they were taking on water. Between the tanker and the storm, the little boat had suffered a pounding, and it had never been very seaworthy to begin with. Senior Castillo had only expected the boat to be on the water for a day, two at the most. How much longer would it take them to get to Florida? And where exactly were they? Hey, is that land? Ivan asked. He pointed over the side of the boat. Isabel and the others scrambled so quickly to see that the boat tipped dangerously in the water. Yes, yes, Isabel could see it. A long, thin, dark green line along the blue horizon. Land. Is it Florida? Ivan asked. It's on the wrong side of the boat to be the U.S., Lee said, Louise said, looking back at the sun. Unless we got blown into the Gulf of Mexico overnight. Whatever it is, I'm steering for it, Amara told them. Everyone watched in silence as the green line turned into hills and trees, and the water got clearer and shallower. Isabel held her breath. She had never been to the United States in her entire life. Was it really the United States? Had they made it? Amara brought them close to shore, then turned and ran south along it. Isabel searched the shore. There. She pointed to red and yellow beach umbrellas with chairs beneath them, and in the beach chairs were white people. A woman in a bikini lifted her black sunglasses and pointed at them. And the man sat w up with her and stared. As the boat rounded the beach, Isabel saw more people all staring and pointing and waving. Yes, yes, we made it. We made it, Isabel said, shaking Ivan's arms. Ivan hopped on and down, up and down so much the boat groaned. Florida, he cried. A black man in a white suit hurried down the beach toward them, waving his arms over his head to get their attention. He yelled something in English and pointed for them to go further south. Amara followed the shore around a bend in the open ocean and gave way to a quiet little bay with a long wooden pier. The pier had a little cafe on it with tables and chairs. Fancy two-man sailboats were parked on the beach next to volleyball courts, and more umbrellas and chairs dotted the sand. Isabel's heart leaped. The U.S. was even more a paradise than she ever imagined. Louise flipped a switch and the putter of the engine died. The white people got up from their tables in the bar to help pull them to the dock, and Isabel and the others reached for their hands. Their fingertips were almost close enough to touch when black men in white short sleeve uniforms pushed their way between the vacationers on the pier and the boat. One of them said something in a language Isabel didn't understand. I think he's asking if we're from Haiti, Lido said to the others in the boat. We are from Cuba, he said slowly in Spanish to the uniformed men. You're from Cuba? The officer asked in Spanish. Yes, yes, they cried. Where are we, Poppy asked. The Bahamas, the man said. The Bahamas? Isabel's mind went back to the map of the Caribbean on the wall of her schoolroom. The Bahamas were islands to the north and east of Havana. 
directly above the middle of Cuba, a long way east of Miami. Had the storm really taken them that far off course? I'm sorry, the officer said, but you are not allowed to land. Bahamian law forbids the entrance of illegal aliens to the Bahamas. If you set foot on Bahamian soil, you will be taken into custody and returned to your country of origin. Behind the officers, one of the tourists who knew Spanish was translating for the others. Some of them looked upset and started arguing with the authorities. But we have a sick pregnant woman, Lito said to the officer. He moved so the men in the dock could see Isabel's mother, and the tourists behind the officers cried out in concern. The officers conferred, and Isabel held her breath. The commandment says that for health reasons, the pregnant woman may come ashore and receive medical attention. The Spanish-speaking officer said, Isabel and Ivan clutched at each other without hope with hope, but she cannot have her baby here, the officer said. As soon as she is well, she will de be deported to Cuba. Isabel and Ivan sagged, and everyone else on the little boat was silent. Isabel felt sick. She wanted her mother to get better, but she didn't want them to be sent away to Cuba. Couldn't the Bahamas just let them stay? How was one more Cuban family going to hurt? She looked back at the pier and nice cafe. They had plenty of room. The situation was explained to the tourists on the pier, and they gasped and waited. All right, Lito said. My daughter is sick. She needs medical attention. No, Poppy said. You heard him. If we step off this boat, they'll send us back to Cuba. I'm not going back. Then I will go with her, Lito said. I care for Teresa's life more than I care for El Nort. Tears ran down Isabel's cheek. No, no, this wasn't the way things were supposed to happen. Her family was supposed to be together. That's why she'd insisted they all go on the boat. And if her mother went back to Cuba and her father went to the United States, which one was she supposed to go with? No, Isabel's mother said. But Teresa, Lito said. No, I don't want my baby born in Cuba. But you're ill. You can't take another ocean voyage, Lito argued. I will not go back, Mommy said. She reached up and took her husband's and her daughter's hands. I will stay with my family. Relieved, Isabel threw herself into her mother's arms. She was surprised when she felt her father kneel down in the boat and hug them both. Sounds like we're leaving then, Louise told everyone in the boat. Before they could get the engine restarted, one of the tourists tossed on a bottle of water to Senora Castillo. Soon the rest of the tourists were hurrying back and forth into the cafe, buying bottles of water and bags of chips and tossing them to everyone's hands on the boat. Aspirin? Does anyone have aspirin for my mother? Isabel begged. Up on the dock, an old white woman understood. She quickly dug around in her purse and tossed a plastic bottle full of pills to Isabel. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel cried. Her heart ached with gratitude toward these people. Just a moment's kindness from each of them might mean the difference between death and survival for her mother and everyone else on the raft. By the time they finally restarted the engine and Amara, Amara swung them around to leave, they had more food and water than they had brought with them to begin with. But they were further away from Florida and its freedom than they had ever seen been before. Page 179. Mahmoud, somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea, 2015. My baby, Mahmoud's mother wailed. My Hannah is gone. The Mediterranean was still attacking them, wave after wave trying to drown them. And Mahmoud could tell that his mother didn't want to fight anymore. It was all Mahmoud could do to keep her head above the water. I'm still here, Mahmoud told her. I need you. I gave my baby to a stranger, Mahmoud's mother howled. I don't even know who she was. She's safe now, Mahmoud told her. Hannah is out of the water. She's going to live. But Mahmoud's mother would not be consoled. She lay back in the water, her face to the sky, and sobbed. The dinghy coming by had re-energized Mahmoud, but he could feel the buzz quickly draining away, replaced by a cold exhaustion that left his arms and legs numb. The sea rolled over him, and he went under again, coming up sputtering. He could not keep himself and his mother afloat, not for long. They were going to die here. But at least Hannah was safe. Yes, he had been the one to convince a stranger to take his little sister away. And yes, his mother might never forgive herself for letting Hannah go. But at least neither of them would have to live long with their regret. The rain began again, the awful, pelting, deadening rain. And it felt to Muhammad like Allah was crying with them, crying for them. They were drowning in tears. Under the sweeping wash of rain, Mahud, Mahmoud heard something like a drumbeat, water on something that was not water. He searched the rising and falling waves until he saw it, the backside of a life jacket still strapped to a man, a man who floated face down in the water. In his mind's eye, Mahmoud immediately filled in the drowned man's face with that of his father, and his heart thumped against his own useless life jacket. 
He flailed in the water, half swimming, half towing his mother toward the body. But no, the life vest was blue and his father's had been orange, like Mahmoud's. This one was a real working life jacket. Mahmoud let his mother go for just a moment and wrestled the body over. It was the big man who had sat next to him on the dinghy. His eyes and mouth were open, but there was no life in either one. The man was dead. It wasn't the first dead body Mahmoud had seen. Not after four years of civil war, with his hometown right in the center of the fighting. A man had been killed right next to him in his family's car, he realized with a start. How long had that how long ago had that been? Days, weeks? It seemed like a lifetime ago. But no matter how many times he saw death, it never stopped being horrifying. Mahmoud shuddered and recoiled. But if the man was dead, that meant he didn't need his life jacket. Mahmoud fought down his fear and fumbled with the straps in the dead man's life jacket. Mahmoud's fingers moved, but he couldn't feel them. His hands were like blocks of ice. He only knew he was touching the straps because it's, he could see it happening. Finally, he got one strap unbuckled and another, and as his body began to shift in the vest, Mahmoud realized he was condemning this man to the bottom of the sea. He would never be bathed and wrapped in a kafan, never be mourned by those who loved him, never have his friends and family say prayers over him, never be buried facing Mecca. Mahmoud was putting a man in his grave and he had a duty to and he had a duty to him. Mahmoud had heard funeral prayers too many times in his short life, most recently for his cousin Sayed, who had died when a barrel bomb exploded. Mahmoud quietly recited one now. Oh God, forgive this man and have mercy on him and give him strength and pardon him. Be generous to him and cause his entrance to be wide and wash him with water and snow and hail. Cleanse him of his transgressions as white cloth is cleansed of stains. Give him an abode better than his home and a family better than his family and a wife better than his wife. Take him into paradise and protect him from the punishment of the grave and the punishment of hellfire. When he was finished, Mahmoud clicked open the last of the straps and the man's body rolled out of the vest and down the murky depths of the Mediterranean. Here, Mom, put this on, Mahmoud said. It took some time to get her into the life jacket, Mahmoud doing most of the work, but at last it was on her, and Mahmoud no longer had a fight to keep her afloat. She lay on her back, eyes closed, muttering about Hana, and Mahmoud clung to her life jacket. He still had to kick his legs not to pull them both under, but not nearly so much. He didn't know where they would go or how they would get out of the water. Perhaps in the light of the day they would see land and be able to swim for it. In the meantime, they had to survive the night. Page 183, Joseph, just outside Havana Harbor, 1939, 18 days from home. Help! My dad jumped overboard! Help! Joseph cried. Far below him, already a couple hundred yards away from the ship, Joseph's father thrashed crazily in the water. He screamed incoherently, but he wasn't calling out for rescue. On the decks below, passengers ran to the rails and pointed. The ship's siren continued to blow and sailors ran about but nobody was doing anything. Joseph spun around helplessly. What was he supposed to do? Jump in after his father? It was such a long way down, and he didn't know how to swim. Down below on sea deck, one of the Cuban policemen tossed his cap and gun belt aside, kicked off his shoes, and jumped headlong into the green water. He hit the ocean with a slap and splash, and for many seconds, Joseph held his breath as though he was the diver himself. Joseph's lungs were just about to burst when the man broke the surface, a few yards away from where he'd hit, gasping for breath. The man flipped the wet hair out of his face until he had his bearings and set off swimming for Joseph's father. Joseph's heart raced as fast as his feet flew down the stairs. He pushed through the crowds and ran to the rail, but the policeman hadn't yet reached his father. A woman screamed and Joseph followed the pointing fingers. Two shark fins had appeared in the water. Joseph froze in terror. There were more screams as his papa sank beneath the waves and Joseph had to cling to the rail not to collapse. One of the St. Louis Louis's lifeboats hit the water and the ship's siren had brought motor launches from the shore. But none of them were going to be in time. The only person close enough to save Joseph's father was a Cuban policeman. Even though the sharks still circled, the policeman took a deep breath and dived beneath the waves. Joseph counted the long seconds before the man broke the surface again this time with Papa in his arms. The passengers on the ship cheered, but Joseph's father didn't want to be rescued. He struggled in the man's arms, beating and flailing at him. Murderers, he cried. They'll never take me. But Papa was weak, and the policeman was strong. One of the motor launches from shore reached them first, and the policeman helped the other men lift Joseph's father onto the boat. Let me die. Let me die, Joseph's father cried. The word struck Joseph like slaps in the face and tears sprang to his eyes. His father would rather die than be with his son, his daughter, his wife. 
The crack of a pistol shot made Joseph jump. One of the men in the boat stood aiming a gun down into the water near the policeman. Peck, peck! He shot twice more, and one of the shark fins turned away from the policeman to attack the shark the man had wounded with his pistol. The men laid Joseph's father in the boat of the bottom of the boat and helped the weary policeman aboard. There were sighs of relief and whispered prayers on the St. Louis, but Joseph's heart lurched when he saw his father kick away the man trying to help him. Papa lunged for the side of the small boat, trying to get back to the sea. Let me die, he cried out again. The policeman grabbed him and pulled him back into the boat. Two more of the men restrained him, and the boat quickly turned and sped toward the shore. The St. Louis's siren stopped blasting, and suddenly it was all over. All around Joseph, passengers wept, but Joseph now felt more stunned than sad. His father was gone. In many ways, his father had never really come back from the concentration camp. Not the father Joseph knew and remembered, not the father he loved. He had come back in body, but not in spirit. Joseph's father was gone. His mother was unconscious. His little sister was all by herself, and they would never let Joseph's family into Cuba now, not after his father had gone mad. Joseph and his family would all be sent back to Germany, back to the Nazis. Joseph's world was falling apart, and he didn't see any way to put it back together again.